example here. Um, okay, I'll recap a little. So, hi everyone. We hope all of you are safe at this terrible time. It's very glad to receive here in the seventh ICTP Cypher FT UNESP physics discussion, the professor and director of the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics, Eichiro Komatsu. Eichiro Komatsu is a Japanese physicist who obtained his bachelor, master's, and PhD degree at the Tohoku University with his dissertation titled The Pursuit of Non-Gaussian Fluctuations in the Cosmic Microwave Background. Then he moved for a postdoc position at Princeton University. Later, he became an assistant and associate professor at the University of Texas, and then the director of the Texas Cosmology Center. Since 2012, he became an honorary professor and director of the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Garch, Germany. His research interests cover many topics like the cosmic microwave background, large scale structure of the universe, sonayev zeldovich effect, dark matter, dark energy, and inflationary scenarios. He has received numerous prizes like the 2018 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics together with the WMEP science team and the American Astronomical Society Lancelot Berkeley Prize in 2013 for the seven-year Wilkinson Microwave and Isotopy Probe paper uh, with the word Ichiro Komatsu. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction and thanks for the invitation. I'm very glad to tell you about our research on finding gravitational waves from the early universe. And uh, so my talk is actually not about detecting gravitational waves directly, uh, but rather we use signature of gravitational waves in photons, particularly polarized light of the fireball universe, what we call the cosmic microwave background. So to set the stage, let me first show you this animation where universe was born and expanding. And universe was very hot and opaque first because universe was so hot that the matter was ionized. Electrons are constantly scattering photons so that the photons cannot go freely until temperature falls down to 3000 Kelvin Electrons are combined into protons forming a neutral hydrogen, which wouldn't scatter light as much as electrons do. Universe became transparent. Universe keeps cooling as time goes by. But one thing I want you to pay attention to in this animation is that you see lumps of matter already. You see irregularities. These irregularities existed already in the very early universe. And after photons are released from these matter clumps, they gravitationally grow, right? They uh, start gather gravitationally. Small things form the first, they merged to form bigger and bigger structures. These bigger structures eventually became galaxies. Inside galaxies, there are billions of stars and each star contains multiple planets. We now know that, you know, quite remarkable. If you're lucky, one, at least one of these planets called Earth would host life. Uh, or maybe there are other planets that would host lives elsewhere. And maybe one day, you know, uh, somewhere in that planet, uh, there's a pandemic and then people have to watch online lectures like I'm doing now, okay? Uh, but all of that was due to these irregularities that existed in the early universe. So that's our origin, okay? Then how can we study that origin? The answer is, this light from the fireball universe. Where did this light from the fireball universe go? You know, they were there shining brilliantly. Are they now gone now somewhere? The answer is no, they are with us everywhere. If you look up sky, night sky in optical wavelength, let's say half a micron, that's the sky you see. If you go to microwave, say one millimeter wavelength, 
skies full of photons, full of the light from the fireball universe. Because the universe has expanded and cooled down, currently the temperature of the uh, photons is three Kelvin, not 3000. So after the universe became transparent, the distance between two points increased by factor of 1000, temperature fell by factor of 1000. So it's three Kelvin instead of 3000 Kelvin. This is what we call the cosmic microwave background. And these photons are numerous if you think about it. If you count number of photons of the cosmic microwave background on earth today per cubic centimeter, there are 410 photons. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's here, <laughs> 410, yeah? So it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. You are surrounded by the photons from the fireball universe. And these days, of course, you know, if you look around, you feel like the space is full of a novel coronavirus. But uh, forget that, you know, you are, you are actually surrounded by the photons from the Big Bang. Let's think it that way, okay? And if you down now uh, map the whole sky using telescope, including, for example, this uh, space telescope that we launched, WMAP satellite, yeah? So first we go from the uh, usual visual wavelength and we go to the um, longer and longer wavelengths, okay? So first that's the uh, visual. And then we go to the um, near infrared, far infrared, some millimeter. By the time you go to the microwave, whole sky is full of the light from the fireball universe. But then when you increase the contrast of your data sets, because your data sets are so sensitive, this map was, for example, taken by this uh, satellite that's spinning on the uh, top right of the screen, you see irregularities. It is the irregularity you saw at the beginning of the animation. So these are the origin of all cosmic structures that we see today, including eventually our lives. All of that is a super complicated concept. And when we give talks on this in front of public audience, they confuse and they don't trust us. They're thinking that we're lying, you know, because scientists um, do science, we're professional, but uh, we are very bad at communicating that. We often fail miserably. The reason is we, th we use our brain too much, but our words do not reach people's heart. We're just big brains, no heart, okay? But if you, communicate, if you actually talk to science communicators, they're very knowledgeable, they're very smart and then uh, understand basic science, but they also know how to reach people's heart. What we did here, for example, was to team up with a movie director, Mr. Hiromitsu Kousaka in Japan, but he's a movie director specialized in Fudom planetarium movie. He created, I think it's a world first Fudom movie dedicated to, to cosmology and cosmic microwave background research in particular. So, if you, so this movie isn't available online yet, but you can see the trailer. If you go to YouTube, uh, then search for Horizon, name of the movie, Beyond the Edge of the Visible Universe, you can see trailer. But I will also show you a couple of examples because I think, hope that these will be useful for today's colloquium also. Okay, let's go. The cosmic background radiation was predicted as a consequence of the expansion of the universe. The beginning of the universe was like a dense ball of fire. Everything was immersed in light. It was just like the center of the sun, like a fog where light couldn't travel straight. However, when the universe cooled down due to expansion, the fog cleared and light could travel farther. Shouldn't this light reach the Earth today? This light 
gives us the oldest picture of the universe that we can ever see directly. But the wavelength of this light has been stretched by the expansion of the universe. And it has gone past visible light and turned into microwaves. Microwaves that come from every direction at once. That's the evidence for the expansion of the universe. Yeah, so we can use words to describe universe was once a hot, dense day, light is there, still with us, microwave, blah, blah, blah. But if you see this movie, hope that it was immediately clear what we're talking about. So movie, the power of movie, always great. So where did this CMB we see today came, come from? If light originated only from the point today, they are already gone. So clearly that's not the light we see. If the light originated one light year away, so the, the whole entire sky was, entire space was lit up, but if the light came from one light year away, they come in one year and go. So that's clearly not the light we see. Light we see came very far away, incredibly far, far, far away. And they traveled. 13.8 billion years to finally, finally reach us. That's the light we see today, okay? It didn't come from our location because they're gone already, yeah? So this incredibly far away and, uh, but because light traveled, the speed of light is finite, as you look farther, the younger that you see, right? So, um, so if you just keep looking farther and farther and farther, you basically see the beginning of the universe. But this isn't quite the beginning because this is the moment when light was last or scattered, okay? Before the universe was opaque, remember? Electrons are constantly scattering photons. This is the moment at which light was last or scattered. Now, if you remember, and this becomes important later, scattering of photons implies polarization. So this scattered light is indeed polarized, but is that it we can see, okay? Because if you wanted to go farther, you, you, you can't using light because universe was opaque before then. You can't go farther in, in the past, but we can still see it beyond this wall using the laws of physics, okay? So although the topic of today's colloquium is gravitational wave, let's talk first about sound waves, scaramos, or density waves. Then we, we go to gravitational waves. So for sound waves, okay, what kind of laws of physics do you use? Because universe, when it was hot, uh, can be described by the uh, density, energy density in photons, gamma, energy density in atoms, baryons, B, and then you have gravitational potentials. So we have gravitational field equations, Einstein's equations, coupled to energy conservation and momentum conservation equations. If you combine them together, you get sound waves. The cosmic background radiation is the wall at the edge of the visible universe. We cannot see directly the further past beyond this wall. But these temperature fluctuations may tell us what happened in the further past. The conditions beyond the wall of the cosmic background radiation could be thought of as a liquid with high temperature and high density. You could say it was like a hot soup. Something happened behind this wall that made waves, which can be seen in the fluctuations in the cosmic background radiation. There must have been a grand sound that shook the universe. We can learn a great deal about the universe if we can extract this cosmic sound. The origin of the sound would be the moment of the birth of the universe. Right, so basically we, we, we assign some initial impact, initial 
fluctuations, initial irregularities. Then we solve differential equations, energy conservation, momentum conservation, gravitational field equations. Then you can predict how sound waves are excited and propagate. And they propagate for about 400,000 years until universe became transparent. And that pattern is what we observe today. But using laws of physics, you can then go backward in time to reconstruct the initial fluctuations because we know equations that govern evolution there. That's a basic idea. And once again, movie is very powerful in conveying that complex information. So universe behaves like a soup. And this is the Japanese signature, uh, sopa de miso, yeah? Uh, Cosmica. So when matter and radiation were hotter than 3000 Kelvin, matter was completely ionized. Universe was filled with plasma, which would behave just like a hot soup. And if you have a soup with a, a varying ingredients, like you have a lots of miso, maybe lots of beans, uh, yeah? Uh, you can have a viscous soup, transparent soup. Then you drop something, you can drop tohus, you can drop potatoes, you can drop anything, you can drop beef, uh, yeah? Then you see how ripples are created and propagated. Depending upon the ingredient of the soup, these ripples will propagate differently. Then perhaps by analyzing the patterns of these ripples, we could learn about composition of the universe as well as what kind of initial conditions that generated them. So how do we analyze the data like that? So what we do is to decompose these fluctuation patterns into set of cosine and sines, figure out coefficients of sines and cosines of different wavelengths, make a diagram of the square of the coefficients of cosine and sines as a function of the inverse wavelengths. If you do that, we get this. So x-axis is one over wavelength. Y-axis is the squared amplitude of the cosine and sine coefficients. If you go to the right, it's shorter wavelengths. If you go to the left, it's longer wavelengths. And as you can see, it's the oscillation, the sound wave. So this is the observational proof that the early universe behaved like a hot soup. So here you see a map of the CMB observed by Planck satellite. It's a European Space Agency satellite. That's this uh, power spectrum. Then uh, what you do is quite simple. So you have this map that you decompose this into set of cosine and sine waves. In this case, it's a spherical wave. So we use spherical harmonics. Then if you go to the very left, that's the longest wavelength. So the wavelength of the wave is as big as the full sky. As you go to the right, wavelengths get shorter and shorter. Then by the time you are done uh, analyzing all the wavelengths, just for the sanity check, you can recombine all the maps of all wavelengths. Then of course you would recover the data that you started with. So this is quite remarkable, right? The uh, sound waves existed in the early universe. And this was theoretically predicted in 1970 by uh, Jim Peebles in Princeton University and his first graduate student, uh, you. And uh, for, for this, outstanding contribution to a foundation of cosmology, uh, Jim Peebles was awarded 2019 Nobel Prize in Physics. It's quite remarkable, you know, 1970, you used laws of physics to say, hey, the universe was like a hot soup and you see sound waves. I mean, that's a remarkable insight. And it took 30 years uh, to be discovered, okay? So uh, the researchers, didn't think that this was really going to be observed, including uh, Jim Peebles himself, but uh, science was so exciting that the people really 
did a great effort uh, to, to improve sensitivity with these experiments to finally, finally observe this. Now, this drawing of face of Jim Peebles is pretty good because that's how it looks really. So this is a time when conference was still possible where people can get together, it seems like century ago. And we are just enjoying a conference in the uh, sunshine. This was December, very hot though. <laughs> Goa, India, a wonderful moment. In the meantime, in former Soviet Union, Moscow, uh, Rashid Sinyaev, and so he's here, and Yakov Zerudovich, his uh, former thesis advisor, predicted exactly the same thing. So they also predicted that sound waves existed in the fireball universe back in 1970. And these remarkable insights, you know, um, sure, it takes 30 years to be discovered, but uh, this is the triumph, triumph. It's a victory of theoretical physics. So young people, even if the effect, effects that you discover seemed too small to be seen today, publish. No matter what senior people tell you, oh, you know, young man, young women, lady, gentleman, uh, this is too small. Forget it. Do something that can be discovered today. Forget, ignore them. You know, they, they are, they are, you know, they are, they're going to retire sooner than you, you will. That's why they suggest to work on something that they can see. You are young, be bold. You can live longer than they do. Go ahead and predict something really new. And if the physics is beautiful and exciting, it will be discovered. Okay. So learn something from the research history of the CMB. We can use a computer calculation to recreate the state of the universe this sound travels through. The universe at this time was dense and behaved like liquid, such as a soup. Ingredients of the soup are the same as those in today's universe. Matter that makes stars and galaxies. And dark matter and dark energy exist, even though they cannot be seen directly by our eyes. Galaxies can keep their shapes, thanks to dark matter providing gravity. It's thought that the universe's expansion is gradually speeding up due to some dark energy pushing space apart. These are the three main ingredients of the soup. Space expanded with time. Let's give some impact to the beginning of this model. Great. I have a pattern for the cosmic background radiation. The reason that this particular pattern does not match our observations is because the ratio of ingredients in the soup is wrong. Waves do not travel through in a thick soup like they do in a thin soup. I'll use the power spectrum to make the patterns match. I have to adjust the ingredients to make my calculation agree with the data. Incredible! The visible part of the universe, like stars and galaxies, makes only 5%. The universe is dominated by invisible components. Well, that's very interesting. Indeed, you can use patterns of the microwave background to learn about the composition of the universe. And we have dark matter, dark energy. We don't know anything about it. Interesting, but that's not the topic of today's colloquium. Today's topic is more about the beginning of the universe, initial conditions. So let's give some impact to the beginning of this model, the movie said. What impact? Who gave it? 
How? So that's the question. The leading idea is no one gave the impact. These initial fluctuations emerged quantum mechanically. So they, they emerged randomly from the vacuum fluctuations. So we all came from the quantum fluctuations in the end, okay? So what's the origin of our cosmic structures? These are the ripples that you can see in the cosmic micro background fluctuations. But what, what's the origin of those fluctuations? And that answer that we think is the quantum mechanical fluctuation in the early universe. But wait a second, okay? That's interesting, but you know, typically quantum mechanical fluctuations exist everywhere, even here in this room, your room, everywhere. But they don't mess with large scales. They are solely microscopic level stuff. They don't really go macroscopic. What's the missing link? The missing link is this gravity and quantum, you know, this marriage. So here you have quantum mechanical fluctuations in expanding space. But not just expansion, it's an enormous expansion. You have exponential expansion of space in the early time called inflation. And then once quantum mechanical fluctuations are generated, wavelength is constantly stretched to macroscopic scales. Inflation states, for example, the something of the size of an atomic nucleus will, si will become the size of solar system in a tiny fraction of a second. Then what? <laughs> How can we believe such a statement? It needs to be verified observationally. And in fact, we have accumulated very good evidence for this cosmic inflation scenario. Since the first discovery of temperature fluctuation by COBE satellite, NASA's COBE satellite in 1992, we have made a tremendous project, but progress. So sound waves were discovered in 2000. Then we had a WMAP satellite that we launched and mapped out the cosmic structures to much better precision then Planck's, ESA's Planck satellite followed, and, and, and a bunch of ground-based and balloon bone experiments were making precise measurements. All of this global community effort led to the conclusion that everything we see is consistent with the properties of quantum mechanical fluctuations in the universe whose wavelengths was stretched by exponential expansion. Hmm. Okay, are we done then? Maybe, but because such a, such a remarkable statement, extraordinary claim requires extraordinary evidence as Carl Sagan stated. So we want to discover not only sound waves, but also gravitational waves. So gravitational waves are coming toward you, okay? You can't see these gravitational waves, which are distortions in space-time, but you can visualize them by watching how particles move. So you have ring of particles, gravitational waves are coming toward Z direction. They use sprinkle ring uh, particles in X and Y directions. And then gravitational waves will change distances between two points in this anisotropic manner. For example, you have Cartesian coordinate, Euclidean space, no distortion, distance between two points square, ds square is dx square plus dy square plus dz square. Space expands because, uh, you know, because the uh, universe uh, space expands in proportion to a, that's a function of time called the scale factor, distance square, so this is proportional to scale factor square. I can write this dx plus dx square plus dy square plus dz square in a slightly fancy form, slightly more fancy form. 
using Kronek as delta, it's the same thing as before, but fancy matter, fun, fancy. Then I add, so this delta ij is diagonal, uh, but I add now distortion in space, hij, that's a symmetric three by three matrix. Then space is no longer Euclidean, okay? It's not ds, dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared, it's more complicated. This distortion describe, contains gravitational wave. Okay, now uh, we're going to impose four conditions. First, like electromagnetic waves, these gravitational waves are transverse. Their distortion directions will be perpendicular to the propagation direction of gravitational waves. So that's vector k, then hij has to be orthogonal to vector k. So that will give you three conditions. Second, these distortions should not change density. These distortions should not change the volume. That means that the determinant of this distortion, ds square, so determinant of delta ij plus hij has to be one. This means the trace of hij is zero. So this is one condition. Six degrees of freedom, so three by three symmetric matrix, six components minus four is two. So you have two degrees of freedom for gravitational waves. Then for gravitational waves propagating in z direction, we can write the components of HIJ in this form. So we have plus mode and cross modes. So there are two polarizations of gravitational waves. Has a deeper reason for it because the uh, gravitational waves can be regarded as spin two particles. Photons are spin one, gravitons spin two. So you can interpret in that way too. So then when gravitational waves are propagating uh, in front of you, you know, the propagation direction is perpendicular to your lines of sight, gravitational waves will look like that. How do we detect it? So one way to detect it is to use laser interferometer. So let me explain to you how it works. You have two mirrors. Then you shoot a laser from the left and beam split. So beam go there, there. And when you beam split, you flip the sign of the uh, electric fields of the laser light. So you go this way, this has wrong, uh, opposite sign. So when they come back and recombined, crests and troughs of electric fields will cancel, okay? Then there's no signal. That's your initial configuration. When gravitational waves, propagate and then stretch space like that, okay? Then distance between mirrors and beam splitter will be different. So crests and troughs of laser light no longer cancel when they are recombined at the detector, you see a signal. In this way, uh, LIGO and Virgo collaborations detected gravitational waves whose wavelength is about size of the earth. These are earth based detectors. So the wavelength that you can see is the size of the earth. You can also launch satellites, uh, mirrors and carrying mirrors and satellites to million kilometers. Then maybe you can be sensitive to wavelengths of the gravitational waves, million kilometers or bigger, but you can't really prove gravitational waves, wavelengths of billions of light years. These are produced by this ginormous inflationary expansion in the early universe. Billions of light years. How do we detect that? For that, we use universe as a detector. When you have isotropic radiation field like cosmic microwave background and gravitational waves propagate through it, it stretches space. And when it stretches space, wavelengths of the light is also stretched. Then, the uh, energy of the photon is smaller here. So when you put electron in the middle, electron will see colder photons coming from right and left, hotter photons coming from top and bottom or 45 degree tilted version of that. 
when these photons are scattered, so photons are coming from left and right. I'm an electron, okay? I see cold here, cold there. Light comes in, I scatter them, and I scatter them into you, okay? And I see hot photons coming from above, hot, of, hot, hot photons coming from the bottom. They come, I scatter them into you. Then you see the light that's polarized in the horizontal direction. In fact, if you want it, you could see that in a daily example. You have a car, sunny day, driving, sunshine comes from the valve, it gets reflected by windshield, that ref so sunlight isn't polarized, but this reflected light is polarized in horizontal direction. How do we tell? So if you buy a pair of polarized sunglasses, which will transmit light for the vertically polarized light, but the block horizontally polarized light that you can see through the car. Okay. So essentially polarization is generated when the incident light is anisotropic. In this case, sunlight comes only from the above. But universe is isotropic. There's no, nothing like bottom up, right, left. It's isotropic. Indeed, if universe were is anisotropic and light only comes from the left, and polarized light gets scattered by electron, and then you produce maximum polarization for 90 degree uh, scattering. But universe doesn't have top, bottom, left, right. So electron C, same intensity of radiation uh, around it. Then there's no polarization. An isotropic in instant light doesn't exist. But as you saw just now, if you have gravitational waves propagating, they can create locally an isotropic radiation field around an electron. Globally, universe is still isotropic, but locally around any given electron, it sees an isotropy. And then when photon was last scattered by electron 13.8 billion years ago, that light is polarized. This polarization, by the way, isn't due to gravitational wave, I must say. This polarization is actually created by an isotropic radiation field of the sound wave scattered by photons, okay? But nonetheless, we know that the polarization exists thanks to beautiful data sets of the uh, European Space Agency's Planck satellite. Let's try to make sense of this polarization pattern. You see here, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. So it looks like you can even interpret it as plane wave going this, this direction. Let's call that plane wave vector, vector L, and then ask whether polarization directions are parallel to or perpendicular to that vector L or 45 degree tilted. As a jargon, we say parallel or perpendicular polarization is E mode, and 45 degree tilted versions will be called B mode. The reason why we make this distinction is that they have distinct sign under parity inversion. When you flip the coordinate, so L goes to minus L, E mode doesn't change. So it's parity even, does not change sign. But B mode flips sign, okay? So it's parity odd. And let me then square the amplitude of cosine and sines. Remember power spectrum? E is parity even. I square, it's still parity even. So power spectrum of E, CLE, is parity even. B is parity odd. I square it and it's parity even, okay? Because B changes sign, B changes sign when square, of course it doesn't change sign. So B mode power spectrum is also parity even. Similarly, temperature and E mode polarization cross power spectrum is also uh, parity even. However, when you cross correlate, 
temperature and B mode polarization or E and B mode polarization, they flip sign under parity inversion. So if cosmology conserves parity, these correlators must vanish to within uncertainty of the experiment. So you can actually use these correlators to look for new physics that violates parity symmetry. That itself is a very exciting research avenue, but I don't talk about that today. I talk about this, so power spectra. This is a temperature power spectrum that you saw already. We have E mode polarization coming from sound waves. So this is the basic polarization you saw in the Planck data. When this is then propagating, directions of these photons are bent, deflected by gravitational acts of the intervening matter called gravitational lensing. When E mode polarization of sound waves is gravitationally lensed, it gets converted into B. So all of these things have been measured, but all of these originate from scatter part divisions, density fluctuations, sound waves, not yet gravitational waves. Next quest toward the early universe, the origin of ourselves is to detect B mode polarization from gravitational waves generated during the period of inflation. Theoretically, this is what we expect, okay? So we hope to find this signal. So to characterize the amplitude of gravitational wave, we square gravitational wave uh, HIJ, then we divide that by the amplitude of the scalar mode square. We call this tensor to scalar ratio because we are dividing amplitude of tensor perturbation by the amplitude of scalar perturbation. We haven't seen it yet. R of 0.05 will give you this that we haven't seen as you can clearly see from these data points with error bars. Yeah, we haven't seen it yet. Current upper bound is 0.06. But with that, we can already rule out some of the theories of the early universe. So you have inflation. Inflation is an exponential expansion of space. What drove exponential expansion? What kind of energy component drove that exponential expansion? We don't know yet. But that's a new field, like a Higgs field, scalar field. Some new field, which may or may not be Higgs field, we don't know. But we could think about some new scalar field called inflaton field, whose potential is phi to the four, phi square, linear in phi. This used to be most popular inflationary models when I was a master student and PhD student. We ruled them out, okay? So when I was a master student, my advisor would tell me, HO, here's it. Uh, here it is. It's the most natural inflation model. You're going to find this thing. As a part of the WMAP team, we looked for the signal, didn't find it. We ruled it out. These experimental tests of some of the wildest theoretical ideas of the very early universe. It's experimentally verifiable, experimentally ruled out. So that's a remarkable thing that we're doing here. Next, so after that's gone, I start hearing people saying, it was never natural. This was the most unnatural thing you can think about. Then people start saying, it's phi square, it's phi. Okay, sure. Year 2013, these were still compatible with the data. But now they are all gone, okay? So if you look at year 2018, here's the tightest contour, they are all gone. Hmm, okay, then what, what should we expect? It turns out that the very first inflation model proposed by Alexei Stravinsky in Moscow in 18, 1980, called R-square inflation. So this inflation model is based upon 
modification to Einstein's gravity. Okay, quantum mechanical corrections to Einstein's gravity. It's a quantum gravitational thing, if you want. They are here. So they are currently very compatible with the data. Also Higgs field are coupled to gravity in a particular way called non-minimal coupling. They're also compatible with data. So these are the next targets. They predict R of 0 0.005, okay? So it's um, 10 times smaller than the current bound. So we're going to look for it. So these are, these are gravitational waves coming from quantum mechanical vacuum fluctuation in space time. But wait a minute. Is that the only source? When you try to solve wave equations, we learn in mathematics class, differential equations have homogeneous solution when there's no source and inhomogeneous solution when there's a source. And for some reason, for many years in the inflation you know, community and cosmic micro background community, the right-hand side was completely forgotten. Nobody talked about it. Only recently people started to realize, well, hold on, why can't we have sources? And <laughs> indeed you can. And if you have the source, Detection of B motor polarization from gravitational wave is no longer telling you quantum nature of space time immediately. So that's not the immediate proof of the quantum gravity as often solved by, by researchers in this field. So let me just make it very clear. Discovery of B motor polarization from gravitational wave is not a priori proof of a quantum mechanical nature of space time. It is not. We have to really show that it's not coming from the source, but from the homogeneous solution. And there are multiple ways we can do it. For example, if you look at in detail the shape of the power spectrum of gravitational waves, for example, this dotted line here is this Alexei Stravinsky's inflation model and it predicts a specific shape. But, and if you look at only high multiples that's accessible from ground-based telescopes, because they cannot cover the whole sky, yeah? You cannot tell whether this is due to Starobinsky's model or something coming from sources such as axions and SU2 gauge fields. You cannot tell the difference here. You really have to launch a satellite mission, next generation satellite mission to probe large angular scales to see the difference between these. Only then you can be sure that uh, what you are seeing is quantum mechanical nature, not from the sources. Or converse is true. If you see that it's actually coming from gauge fields during inflation, that's a breakthrough in our understanding of the early universe. This is only one thing that you can look at. So experimental strategy commonly accepted so far is you detect cosmic micro background polarization in multiple frequency channels to make sure that it's a black body spectrum. It's a Planck spectrum, that's CMB. Then shape is as predicted by Stravinsky, okay? That's number two. Then commonly, if the answer to this question is yes, you say we discovered vacuum fluctuation in space time. But that's not, that shouldn't be the strategy anymore. We should have third and fourth. For example, if this gravitational wave was generated by SU2 gauge fields, which have handedness, left and right, then you can have parity violating circular polarization of gravitational wave. Left-handed polarization, left-handed gravitational waves are there, but not right-handed. This can be seen in TB and EB cross correlations that we, I briefly mentioned. That needs to be checked. 
If these are coming from vacuum fluctuations, the statistical distribution of gravitational waves, B multiple polarization would be very Gaussian. But if it's coming from SU2 gauge fields, they self interact quite strongly and they will give you highly non Gaussian fields. So, this Gaussian empty test is another thing we must do. If you answer to all of four questions is yes, we may announce discovery of the vacuum fluctuation in space time. If not, we discovered new physics, new particle physics during inflation. That would be the absolutely the breakthrough discovery. Uh, so that'd be great. So let's talk about the experimental landscape. So, I, so um, this field is driven by remarkable technological advances. There's a, almost like a Moore's law in the reduction in the experimental noise level of the CMB experiments. Here you have W map noise. Here now is noise level is 100 times smaller, more than 100 times smaller. And if you wanted to uh, reduce the noise level of 100 times, you need to observe 10,000 times longer, but that's not practical. So you have to then increase the number of sensors, microwave sensors by a factor of 10,000. That's exactly what researchers have done. We have devised ever more sensitive microwave sensors cameras. And it used to be only a few pixels. Now we have tens of thousands of pixels. And next generation CMB experiment called CMB stage four would have million pixels. Now we, and honestly, we didn't need, we, we never needed such a camera with millions of sensors. This was created purely from the need of the cosmic microwave background experiments. So coming back to 1970, Jim Peebles, Rashid Sunyev, Yakov they never thought that sound waves from the universe would be detected. But if the science is exciting, we get there. You know, this uh, exponential reduction in the sensitivity now to find the signature of polarization, signature of gravitation wave in the faint polarization of the cosmic micro background. Now we have ground-based experiments, Atacama Cosmology Telescope in Atacama Desert, Chile, South, South Pole Telescope in South Pole, Simon's Array in Chile, Bicep and Kicker Array in South Pole, class experiment in Chile. And all of these experiments were led by universities and uh, each would cost something like $10 million, $20 million. But now we realize that if we wanted to go further in sensitivity, we need more money. So we would then join the efforts and create maybe $100 million experiments in early 2020 or $600 million experiment in late 2020, hoping to see signature of gravitational wave and polarization. But as I said, ground-based experiments cannot cover full sky, so they won't be able to distinguish between source of gravitational wave and vacuum fluctuation. To do that, eventually we need a space mission, and I'm pleased to let you know that May 2019, we heard the wonderful news that the JAXA, Japanese Space Agency, selected next generation CMB satellite, Lightbird, as the next uh, mission led by JAXA. And we, this is the first time, so Kobe was NASA, WMAP NASA, Planck was ESA, it's the first time the Japanese Space Agency will lead cosmic micro background satellite mission. Of course, we work with NASA, Canadian Space Agency in Europe, but we go, to, we go to space and do the definitive measurement of CMB polarization. But actually, not just CMB. 
These quantum mechanical fluctuations during inflation are constantly producing gravitational wave at all wavelengths, all frequencies. For example, light bird was observed 10 to the minus 18 hertz. This corresponds to wavelengths of billions of light years. You can convince yourself, okay, 10 to the minus 18, uh, conversion factor between wavelengths and frequencies, speed of light, then you can convince yourself that this indeed corresponds to billions of light years. But you can also use direct detection experiments such as laser interferometer, LISA, okay? It will be launched by European Space Agency. They have million kilometer arm lengths in space. Then they can see millihertz wavelengths, millihertz frequency. You can also have uh, like a next generation ground-based so you have LIGO, Virgo, Kagura in Japan, but then you have Einstein telescope planned in Europe or uh, a cosmic explorer planned in the USA. And you can also have astrophysical bodies like pulsars as gravitational wave detectors. So the square kilometer array, that's the radio antennas, ultimate radio antennas we can have on earth probably. And you can use pulsars, distances to pulsars to detect gravitational wave. You are sensitive to nano health, theta minus nine. All together, you can see whether, you know, we can work all together to detect gravitational wave from the early universe at over 21 order of the magnitude in the frequency. Wouldn't that be wonderful? That would be really awesome. So summary, towards finding our origins. We have, so based upon cosmic micro background experiments using sound waves from the early universe, we have very good evidence that we all came from the quantum mechanical fluctuation in the early universe generated during the period of cosmic inflation. We could be satisfied today, but extraordinary claim requires extraordinary evidence. We wanna find definitive evidence for inflation by detecting and measuring primordial gravitational wave. We can do this using B model polarization, hoping to find the first evidence from ground-based and balloon bone experiments. But then we will launch Lightbird to find the definitive measurement of that. So I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aichiro. That was a nice presentation. So we start with questions now. We have already two questions. One from Nahuel that asks, uh, do we need to have a full knowledge about the B-modes coming from Lansing in order to subtract it and eventually to find the primordial B-modes? The answer is yes. Uh, but we can measure this, yeah. So we can actually measure this beam of polarization from ground-based experiments, and you know, very precise measurement here, 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 here. We can do this. Then uh, we can measure this and subtract from this beam of power spectrum and see in looking for leftover signature like this one. Yes, indeed. Uh, another question by Pedro Oliveira. Um, does this type of analysis of the beginning of the universe indicate any clue about the matter antimatter asymmetry in the universe today? So, it, yeah, wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be wonderful? <laughs> Cosmic micro background experiments itself wouldn't give us a clue. But indirectly, we might, found, we might find the evidence. For example, if we discover that our gravitational waves are coming from the gauge fields, let's say we have this thing here and, and, and a circularly polarized gravitation wave and highly non-Gaussian gravitation wave. Let's say we're convinced that they came from SU2 gauge fields. SU2 gauge fields, they're coupled to fermions. 
And, and uh, Saharov's conditions for creating Martin diameter symmetry is a violation of CP. And then uh, out of equilibrium and uh, barrier number uh, non conservation. So, what you need is a CP. The CP can be violated during inflation by this axion SU2 gauge field in fermion couplings. So, you can actually violate CP during inflation. And then these fermions can generate matter anti matter symmetry later uh, by. Uh, by carrying this CP violation from the reverse. So if you detect a uh, signature of gauge field in this manner, we might have a clue. And if the uh, matter anti matter symmetry came, originated from uh, uh, in this manner, you can actually explain. So this was a wonderful work by a uh, researcher at CERN, uh, Azadeh Marek Nejad. So her recent proposal is, she noticed a very uh, curious coincidence that matter antimatter excess asymmetry divided by the number density of photons called baryon to photon ratio is 10 to minus eight, 10 to minus nine. And that same order of magnitude as the amplitude of scalar perturbation power spectrum, it's 10 to minus nine. And uh, so, so inflation, if inflation was a common origin for both matter antimatter symmetry, asymmetry and curvature perturbation, you can explain this. And key is the gauge field in axiom and coupling to fermions. So that's fairly indirect, I know, but uh, uh, this kind of study could potentially tell you, could tend to give you a clue about that. Uh, thanks. There is another question by Antonio Mario Magalhães. How precise we need to have the knowledge of the galactic power ground polarization in order to best estimate the CMB polarization. Thanks for the excellent talk. And thank you for asking that very important question. I was pretending that we have this map, okay? What I didn't tell you, I kind of showed you, but didn't tell you is that our sky actually looked more like uh, this. Okay, there is this microwave emission coming from our own galaxy. And in the later map that I showed, this microwave emission was taken away. How is that possible? We know that the cosmic microwave background is a, a black body spectrum. This Milky Way emission is not black body spectrum. So we can actually clean galactic emission by requiring that we want to have something that looks like a black body spectrum. In this way, you can take away, take out um, emission from the, uh, my, uh, from the Milky Way. However, we're, look, we're after very faint signal in polarization, B model polarization. So the requirement for this subtraction is quite severe. And to reach, our science goal of light bird, we have to remove galactic foreground emission, you know, this one, Milky Way emission, to about percent level. In other words, we have to remove contribution 99% of microwave emission coming from galaxy. It's challenging, but it's, it's possible. Looks like we can do it, but probably not much below, okay? We probably cannot do 99.9% .9 subtraction. So that's why, um, in theory, we can arbitrarily go down with a very, very faint, you know, faint of the scalar ratio uh, here in the power spectrum. Here, uh, this R is 0 0.05, Starabinsky is 0 0.005, light bar target is 0 0.001. In principle, you know, you can just build more detectors and go down further in practice because of this microwave emission from the, our own galaxy, I don't think we can do much below. So uh, in that sense, light bulb measurement would be the most definitive measurement to be more. So I hope, I hope that the tensor to scalar ratio would be bigger than 0 0.001. Uh, maybe 0 0.005 as Alexei Stravinsky suggested. We'll see.
Thanks. I uh, have another question by Jessica Santiago. Could you please explain a bit further what exactly is the origin of these E and B modes in the early universe if they're yes. not coming from gravitational waves? Yes. So uh, these are coming from the uh, sound waves. So sound waves uh, generate, uh, uh, well, so basically, uh, here, let me, here, here's the thing I should see, show you. So, um, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Necessary and sufficient condition for production of gravitation, the production of polarization is scattering of anisotropic in incident light. Then the question is, what generated anisotropic in instant light around an electron? Gravitational wave is one way. Sound wave is another way. And as sound waves propagate, yeah, it produces hot spot, cold spot, hot spot, cold spot, because after all, it's really you know, longitudinal waves. So then uh, this longitudinal wave, as seen from electron, okay? Uh, let's see, what's the, so you have hot, cold, hot, cold, longitudinal. And I'm here, I see cold, cold, and I see hot, hot. I scatter that and produce polarization. So that's how sound waves can produce polarization. Now, I don't know if that actually made sense to you, but uh, there's an important implication of what I just said, uh, okay? So if I have longitudinal wave, and then here, cold, cold, hot, hot, then I can only generate, um, what did I say? Cold, cold, hot, hot, yeah? So then it's a horizontal polarization. But wave number direction is this way. It's a longitudinal wave going this way. So it's parallel to wavelengths, wave number of the uh, longitudinal wave. If I'm here, hot, hot, cold, cold, I get, I generate vertical polarization. But you see that never 45 degree tilted. So these sound waves can only give you E mode polarization. Okay. That's why you see only E mode polarization from sound wave. Gravitation lensing then can convert this E to B, but sound waves cannot generate B by itself. That's why, aside from this B mode from lensing, which you can predict, B mode polarization is a very clean window into the gravitational wave because you don't see, if this existed, it's hopeless that we can see this. But this is irrelevant because it's E coming from a sound wave. It's not B, okay? So what we should be comparing is this versus this. That's much better than this compared to that, okay? So thanks for the, asking the question. Uh, so longitudinal wave, hot cold, hot cold, produces uh, E mode polarization only from the sound wave. Uh, thanks, we have another question. Uh, Leila Lobat, uh, in the conditions that you mentioned for claiming and detection of B modes from vacuum fluctuations, mm -hmm. is there the condition that the spectrum must be scale invariant? However, the scale dependent spectrum is found, then the vacuum origin of the fluctuations is still not discarded. Is this correct? Let's see. Um... It depends on how much deviation from scale invariance. Indeed, um, the Stalabinsky model, for example, produces slightly scale dependent gravitational wave spectrum, but only slightly, not by large amount. Certainly not as large as this, certainly not. So this cannot be consistent with a vacuum fluctuation from single field thrower inflation. 
So yeah, uh, it, it's not going to be very easy uh, to accommodate strongly scale dependent spectrum within the context of single field stroll or usual vacuum fluctuation models. Um, yeah, they, they predict slightly scale dependent, but this will be too small to be detected, unfortunately. I wonder if I answered your question uh, right. Uh, just say, say something uh, if I didn't answer you very well. <laughs> well, shoot me an email if, you, if you're not satisfied. Um, okay. <laughs> I don't know if you had some specific models in your mind. Uh, if you had, uh, just, just send me an email. <laughs> I'll be happy to talk. Hello? Uh, okay, it's back now, uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, we're gonna end the, the YouTube live stream, but before that, uh, let's, just let me un announce the next phys physics discussion in May 19th, Wednesday, by Le Leticia Kuglandolo from Sorbonne University. Uh, about thermodynamic concepts out of equilibrium from classical to quantum. So we thank again Ichiro Komatsu. And now we go to the student session. Thanks. Bye.